Hello, welcome everyone. Hope your day is going well. We will start here shortly, but this is a workshop event in our Polygon Hackathon. Um, we have a speaker here today, going to have a great event. Um, everybody, you know, post in the chat where you're from. We, I think we have people all over the world. Thanks for everybody joining. If it's, you know, morning, afternoon, night, um, we're, we'll have a great little workshop for you today. So this is part, like I said, part of our Polygon Hackathon. This workshop is specifically getting multi-chain Web3 data with one unified API with our host here today from Covalent, Lei Bing. Um, very smart guy. We're going to hand it over to him now um, to kind of get the ball rolling. We're going to have a presentation and then we'll answer questions at the end. So if you do have a question, that's totally fine. Post in the chat, but we will get to that at the end. So Lei Bing, uh, we'll pass it over to you. Um, All right, guys. Uh, thanks. Hold on. Let me just go to the first slide here. <laughs> um, thanks, everyone, for joining. I see that we've got quite a large audience here. And I believe it is the middle of your um, Solidity workshop. Oh, no. Polygon Hackathon, right? Where it's like a four-week-long hackathon where you like, hack on all sorts of challenges that uh, the ENCODE team has put up for you guys. So I hope you guys are having fun. We are in week one, are we, or week two? We're in like about week three here. We're in like week I'm just three. just the start so you... of week three, yeah. Okay, so you guys are like in the middle of like building your projects already, I assume. Right. Awesome. Um, so we are Covalent, um, I'm Lei Bing and I work at uh, Developer Relations here at Covalent and um, in this workshop hopefully I can just take you through what's the problem that we're going to solve um, for you guys and also the challenge that we got for you in this hackathon, right? Um, the title of this workshop is Getting Multi-Chain Web3 Data One Unified API. Um, I'm sure, you know, you guys are devs, you have worked with APIs before, you guys have queried data on chain by now, uh, through different protocols as well. Um, so our solution is one of the many solutions that you can use to get data into your Web3 app. All right. Um, so I'll be answering questions at the end, but feel free to just drop your questions uh, into the chat as and when. We can just go through whatever questions that we have on the end uh, as well. And you can also like just unmute yourself to uh, speak up. Feel free to as well at the end. All right. What we're going to cover today, right? The Web3 data trends and challenges. We're in the middle of a bear market right now as everyone probably know by now but you know uh, they, the data side of things still remain and the challenges still remain right so um, our solution that we have at Covalent is what we hope to kind of tide the builders through this bear market as well to bring you all to the next bull market where everything is happening and also bear market is a great time to build anyway so what is the Covalent API we'll be taking you through that or what is the Covalent Network, right? And also some project demos, uh, as well as uh, hackathon uh, bounties that we have for you in this hackathon. So as you know, um, this is the rough model of the history uh, of the web as split according to web one, web two, web three, right? So, you know, this is like kind of almost like a canonical textbook definition of the three distinct eras of the web by now, where web one was the read web, right? You can only like read from the web. Web two brought about interactivity through read and write. And the web three, what they call um, read, write, execute, or some call it read, write, own, right? Um, really embracing the incentives brought about by ownership and tokenomic structures. So, um, you know, the ideal version of Web3 is that it is open, trustless, permissionless, 
and composable, right? It's slightly different to Web2 in some ways. Uh, the openness and ownership aspect is different for Web2, right? Platforms like Facebook, um, Google, they own the data. The data is not public, right? Every like that you have is stored in the Facebook server. Every react that you have is stored in the Facebook server. Uh, whereas in Web3, um, most of the data is all public. You can query it. It is, um, it is out there for you to consume. It is out there for you to port over into your app. It is trustless in the sense that, of course, um, you do not need um, to... The idea is that you do not need to trust the platforms or the protocols themselves. Trust is distributed across the system through um, its consensus alg algorithms, right? Proof of work, proof of stake, whatsoever. All these mechanisms are there for you to create trustless immutable data. It is permissionless. You do not need permission to interact with the blockchain, right? And also composable where each app is kind of built on the other app. Okay, so um, yeah, like for instance, there's lots of um, dApps like um, uh, Uniswap, right? They are, on, they are on Ethereum and then there are apps that built on Uniswap using the Uniswap protocol, right? It, it's like money Legos in some ways. So the trend, the big trend is that by, you know, within the next five years, there are millions of critical data on public blockchains. There'll be dozens of single use and multi-use blockchains, right? We already see it uh, popping out like, you know, blockchains, layer one blockchains, there are so many of them, you can't really count them anymore by now. There's also these, um, you know, uh, app chains, right? Within each large layer one, like supernets, subnets, you know, these things are just single app specific chains that's popping up. There's going to be thousands of applications and Web3 will see even more users within the next five years, right? And because of that, there are certain data challenges for you as the dev, right? Each, each blockchain is its own ecosystem and they hardly really talk to each other um, unless you are in, of course, like bridge technology. But as you've seen in the last like mm, three, four months, right? And also Vitalik, Buterin was a uh, you know, very vocal critic of this bridging technology. We see lots of security problems as well. Um, from the point of view of a developer, how do you get the data from, let's say, Solana and then Ethereum and also Polygon in a consistent manner? Because you don't want to get too deep in the nitty gritties of you know, finding out how the data is structured for every single blockchain. They're structured differently, right? And so that poses a challenge for you. For instance, oh, I really want to find out the number of transactions that happens on the day, uh, yesterday on Solana chain. Versus, oh, I want to find out the number of transactions that happened uh, on a Polygon chain three days ago, right? How do you do that without really spending extra time and mental gas, really writing those customized queries? Mm, and that's where we come in with the solution. Um, Another challenge is that, you know, to get the data, typically you either query like a service like ours or you host a full node, right? Full archive node or full light node or whatever node. And the problem is that it's hugely computationally intensive. You need what, like 20 plus gigs, I think, to host a full Ethereum node. For most of us, we don't simply don't have the resources or the time or the effort to do something like that. And worse, the data is like missing or inconsistent. So we saw the need for this, a more unified solution where you have like one platform to really get a standardized format across different blockchains. And that's what we provide with our service. The, blo the blockchains themselves are the host to this data. Uh, and we see ourselves as the, this data layer that gets all the different data across blockchains in standardized formats 
in order to power whatever user client facing applications, right? Yep, we are a single API by single API. That means that our API, uh, each endpoint can be used across every single blockchain just by changing one um, chain ID. All right, later I'll show you what that looks like. You can query it from the browser. You can query it from Postman, from your, you know, every environment terminal, from your code. And we also have a node code option on our developer documentation site where you can just specify the mode, the analyst mode, and you can get all your responses in CSV or Google Sheets format. Of course, that will enable you to get multi-chain data in a matter of minutes. As a company, we are moving towards progressive decentralization, which means that um, we have currently an infrastructure set up such that the data that is being indexed will be uh, kind of like exposed to our clients who have caused the data in the form of validator nodes. Those validator nodes will be the ones that serving the data requests. So we all the responses of our services will be done in this decentralized manner, which is what we see as the most fitting as a Web3 organization, right? Uh, it is something that, of course, is challenging, but I think our engineering team has spent a lot of resources on this and a lot of effort in making sure that uh, the values of Covalent kind of really chimes in with the values of Web3. We saw lots of challenges, I think, recently as well with, you know, this whole idea of, for instance, uh, oh, MetaMask is a decentralized service. They are. They are great, right? But we see this um, certain data infrastructure that they rely on not necessarily, you know, being as decentralized and that posed a challenge as well. So, yep, this, without going too much into detail, this is how we would like to implement our decentralized tech stack. And our users, of course, are like analysts and developers like yourself. All right, let me take you all through a quick demo of the Covalent API. So, this is the um, the beautiful API reference documentation site that all of us use day in and day out, and you would probably use if you want to work uh, with our data. We have two classes of endpoints. One is what we call our class A endpoints, and one is the class B endpoints. Um, so class A endpoints refer to uh, the data that you can get consistently across every single chain that we support. And we support around like 28, 29 to 30 chains here right now, as you can see. And you know, what's some of the data, right? Oh, you want balances data. What do I have in my wallet, right? Uh, you can build the same thing that you see on MetaMask right here using the balances data. Get token balances for address. We have this, there's a demo. There's a demo address right now that is this address. I'm not sure which address. It's just used as a demo address for our documentation site. And you click run and you see the balances that this, this wallet address has. It is denominated in USD. And for this token, which is kydy.org, um, this is the balance. So it is denominated in way, right? If you're familiar with blockchain development, you would not be that afraid of huge numbers. When I first started, I looked at these numbers, I'm like, what on earth? I'm never gonna be able to understand Web3, but all you need to do to get this into standard unit, which is in ETH, right? Is to take this balance divided by 10 to the power of the contract decimals that you see here. So that will give you the balance in ETH, which is the standard unit, right? 
And then this person has lots of tokens, like, oh, you see a USDC, you see a RAP, RAP BTC uh, with this balance. And he also has a quote rate figure, right? Which is the amount in USD of the person's ETC, uh, BTC holdings. So with this, this is a very, very popular endpoint of ours. With this, you can basically build um, any wallet across any chain, right? And it's a multi-chain wallet, which means that with this singular endpoint, you get your holdings in Polygon, you get your holdings in uh, Solana, you get your holdings in uh, Clayton, Arbitrum, you know, Phantom, Avalanche, every single um, chain. So it's a really, really powerful endpoint. On top of that, to get your, you know, historical holdings, we have this. This endpoint allows you to kind of chart, you know, uh, maybe two months ago, what's my historical holdings looking like, right? So this really powers that kind of application. This one allows you to get all the transfers that I've made, right? Another endpoint perfect for building wallets. You wanna see, you know, what kind of transfers this person has made ever. So this gets you that. Another one that uh, is really useful is get token holders as of any block height. So for instance, you wanna find out how many Doge users are there as of block number 1,300,008T1000, et cetera, anyway. You want to find out how many token holders at any single block height, right? Um, you use this and you get the, an array of the token holders, really powerful. And this works for NFTs as well. So I want to see how many uh, bought a owners are there, you know, today. You don't have to specify the block height. If, um, if you don't specify the block height, it assumes that it's the latest block height and it'll get you the latest token holders, the latest number of owners of Bot Ape today, right? So it's great. And our NFT endpoints, you can get, you know, when you have a, uh, an NFT collection, sometimes you don't know what the tokens they are out there and you use this one. You get the NFT token IDs for the entire contract. They'll return you a list of all the token IDs for the contract. And this is what the response looks like. We are currently looking at this NFT collection, meme, limited, right? I'm not too familiar with what this NFT collection is, but as you can see, you got lots of items. It's got, within this collection, you've got 527 NFTs, okay? And what's their IDs? Yeah, there you go. So yeah, another really powerful endpoint. And for each of these tokens, right, you can get it like its images it's, and its external metadata. So I've inputted here token number 123 of the memes collection. And here we have um, its image. We can just copy it here and let's see. What it, what it looks like, memes token. Uh, oh, there's a resizing issue, it looks like. That is strange. Let's see this one. So it had two URLs in there, so. Oh, did I? Oh my God, yeah, I did. Thanks. Okay, anyway, maybe maybe I'll try, maybe there's something wrong with this particular um, image. I'll be taking it to my team and figuring out what this is after. We've got uh, someone raising his hand, Rashid. Um, he does say, don't buy me. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so, and then we've got within NFTs, yeah, so that was the metadata for contract, right? You get images, you get its traits as well. Remember the OpenSea page where you see all the different traits of the NFTs? So you have them 
here as well, and you can build it into all your sites. And of course, you want to see what kind of transactions are made against the bot aid collection, for instance, and you can use this uh, endpoint to do that. We have some base blockchain data for, for instance, get a block. You can get a block height. You can get the um, log events by contract address. And if you're familiar with what log events is, this is quite a powerful one as well. For instance, every contract, um, whenever someone performs a function to it, uh, a right function, uh, a well-designed contract will emit these things called events. And with events, the public, i.e. us as developers, would be able to know what kind of interactions have been performed against those contracts. So, um, Maybe I'll just, I'm not sure what the demo here is, but this is, this is what it is, right? So this is what it looks like. Um, let me see which is the contract address. The contract address is, so the contract name, I believe is compound governor alpha. And there is a vote cast there's a vote cast function which was performed. Uh, who is it performed by? This voter address, right? And it has a proposal ID of 42. So it probably cast a vote for, uh, you know, proposal number 42 against the compound governor alpha contract. And this is the current number of votes, I believe. So, it is pretty data rich, this endpoint, and it entails you to familiarize yourself more with the log events, and this will really make sense, All right? And every single log event has a topic hash as well. So um, when you query the log events by topic hash, that will give you a horizontal query of the data. So it will not just query it by the log events emitted by the contract, it will query it according to the log events that have the same topic hash. So for instance, a common event is a transfer event. If you query the topic hash of the transfer event, it will give you, um, it will return you all the transfer events that has recently happened on the chain. All right, so, and then you can see, oh, how many transfer events uh, are there on Ethereum chain, for instance, within the last 24 hours? You can use this endpoint to find out the answer for that. So it's another really useful um, endpoint. Yeah, so that's about it for our class A endpoints. You should uh, get an API key to just play around, explore, it's free. Right, uh, there's a current limit of five API calls per second. And yeah, if you explore the data in a Python notebook, Jupyter notebook format, or in, a, in, a, in your code, it probably is a little bit easier for you to find out what the underlying structure, data structure is, and for you to make good sense of it. Uh, within each of this, you can click on view response to look at what the attribute, returned attributes are as well. Yep, class B endpoints are protocol specific endpoints. So for instance, we used to have like Uniswap, um, uh, Aave, Compound under class B endpoints. I believe it is currently under maintenance or something. And so they put it out. But the basic idea is instead of just, you know, the standard endpoints that exist across all blockchains, class B are protocol specific for protocol, uh, applications. Like for instance, you want to build like a DeFi Llama, right? And you want to find out how many, what's the total value lock or the number of pools across Uniswap, right? You can use the X, X, Y equals to K endpoint. The reason why it's called X, Y equals to K um, is because this is the constant product formula that enables most access to function. And with this endpoint, you can actually get um, 
all the all the Uniswap like DEXs, right, on a particular chain. So for instance, you can get the the pools that's available on Uniswap as well as SushiSwap on Ethereum by specifying this. Let's give it a go. You select Uniswap and chain ID one. Let's run this. There you go. So what are the pools? You've got item number zero, which is, uh, what's the pool name? So for each pool, you have a token zero and token one, right? These are the current pairs. So each of these will have a contract address. And typically, if you Google the contract address, oh, they've got a name here, a contract name. This is Rep Ether. Token one is Rep Ether. Token zero, I'm not too sure, but maybe let's take a look at the next one. Okay, this is another pool with now, but you can always Google the uh, contract address on Etherscan. So let's see what token this is. Oh, it is a Darwinia Network native token pool. <laughs> I don't know what this is, but it is that liquidity pool on um, Uniswap against trading against Rep Ether. All right. So we've got lots of pools here on Uniswap, of course, and that's why it's pretty long. You can see lots of different kinds of pools. You've got a countdown pool against Ether. You've got rally pool against Ether. Yep. And you can also find the uh, pools by address. If you include the address of the liquidity pool, you will get lots of information, price information, I believe, about the pool itself. For instance, how many swaps have been done on that pool? What's the volume, 24 hour volume of that pool? What's the total fees that we've, the pool collected in the 24 hours, right? And if you're wondering how, um, how current is this data, uh, Covalent has a latency of two blocks, right? So for Ethereum, the block duration is 14 seconds to 15 seconds. So our data is as fresh as two blocks away, which is 30 seconds for Ethereum. Or for other networks with, um, let's say if you have a five second block, production time, then our latency is 10 seconds away. So it's always uh, really fresh. All right, and we have some pricing endpoints, et cetera. Yep, so the challenge for this um, hackathon that we had for you was to use any of these APIs, right? Any of these endpoints and include it into your encode club polygon build, okay? So you can build wallets. It's very good for building wallets. It's very good, all these endpoints, right? By wallets, I just mean like a display for your multi-chain portfolio, portfolio managers, right? You can take this data and you visualize it in some way. You can do some data analytics on it. You can do it in, uh, in different charting libraries. You can do it in your uh, JavaScript. You can do it also in a Jupyter Notebook format, right? We've seen lots of uh, Python-based applications as well, submissions, I mean. And we've got NFT data as well. You can use this to create NFT data, uh, gallery, NFT galleries, marketplaces. You can use it to create a, uh, Analytics dashboards. There's this um, mutual, there's this uh, winner of a recent hackathon that used our API. So this one is an analytics dashboard that kind of um, 
does compares who the mutual owner of the NFTs are. So for instance, there's two collections. We've got this Azuki and Moonbirds, right? Who are the mutual owners of these two collections? Let's uh, give it some time to load up all the data. Ah, there we go. You have some, uh, you have some basic stats on the NFT collections. You've got this Azuki collection with 10,000 total supply and 5,183 unique owners. So, you know, this is the data that is supplied by our API. And this one has more unique owners. So Moonbirds is a bit more decentralized in terms of owner concentration. And 445 wallets own both Moonbirds and Azuki, right? And um, yeah, it does some more number crunching here. And it has a will check uh, figure, which is that how many holders actually hold more than 100 of this Azuki. So we see that six of them hold more than 100, which means that these guys are whales. They've, they hold you know, so many NFTs here, right? And versus this one, Moonbirds, we've got one person holding 100 plus tokens, one person holding 51 to 99, and so, yeah, just simply based on this, we can see that there's more whales invested in Azuki than Moonbirds, all right? So this is an example of a very useful kind of application that you can build with our API. Um, let me think. Someone has built a command line interface as well that basically calls our API through uh, the command line, right? And the person also kind of, um, what you call, um, built a Rust interface so that Rust developers can call it within their Rust-based environment as well. And let me see, who else have we got as winners? Um, yeah, projects have come up with like very unique um, wallets. I believe there's a Widow Router. Widow Router, I'm just gonna showcase this one. So this is an example of like a brilliant project. It takes your assets on one chain and um, basically funnels it to another chain, right? I'm not too familiar with how the backend is done, but um, so all this, the number of tokens, this particular page here, the, this particular function that displays your number of token holdings in one chain versus the other chain is built using our API. I'm not logged in here, so you can't really see it, but um, yeah. So as you can see, your, there's no limits to what you can build really. And how you integrate the API depends on what kind of features you wanna build. And the features that we can allow you to build using our API are the ones that I generally went through just now. Yep, there was one um, project that also kind of created like a Web3 Discord where they used our get token holders as of any block height to create like a NFT token gated uh, login system. Like for instance, I need to own like a Azuki NFT to automatically log in to a community on that app. And then a specific channel will be created for me on that application. So yes, uh, I've gone through basically everything that I needed to show you um, and all the best, all the best hacking. All right, uh, time for questions. Let me, let me just go through some of the chat that we've got here. Okay, U unified data solution. Uh, I think I explained a bit 
just now, you know, we just provide a standardized response format for you to get multi-chain data. Oh, yes, uh, this is a good question. Would the API work for both on and off-chain data? I think most of the data that we supply are on-chain data, right? Uh, that's really where we see uh, us plugging the gap. For off-chain data, it's a very interesting question because, you know, for NFTs, the images are technically not on-chain data. They're actually hosted on uh, other kind of services, right? So for that, I think our engineers went to query those data servers. They are not on-chain, but these servers are relied on by every single big name like OpenSea, etc. to host the data as well. So we kind of have this like hybrid approach where most of our data is on-chain, but for things like NFT image URL, which is already hosted like uh, off-chain, we get it from whoever that's providing it. What makes Covalent API unique compared to other providers in the market for the same service? Uh, we think that our API is unique in terms of the breadth of the number of chains that we provide in terms of the speed, you can try it for yourself. Um, and also in terms of, I think, what you can kind of build with each of these endpoints, right? Uh, our data is really, really rich. So we pride ourselves in having like the richest kind of like data out there. Yep. And of course, um, we hope to be the most consistent and reliable decentralized service that is out there for Web3 data. All right. Why is it important to know the height of a block? It's important for a couple of reasons because um, I think that particular endpoint, if I'm getting your question right, allows you to get the block height of a day, of a particular day, right? Which is not something that's easy to get. Like, I, if I want to know what's the block height of Ethereum on the 1st of January, can you find that on Etherscan? It's a bit hard, actually. Or you want to find the block height of another chain on the 1st of January. It's a bit hard. So that endpoint allows you to get the block height of a day. And so by the name of the endpoint itself, I get that it does not really specify that. And I think that's an improvement to be made there, I think. Mm, if you're interested to know about the transaction, yeah, yeah. Yes, so you can use Morales. We have a plugin with them. Basically, they, they've uh, created a wrapper to call our data. So you can use the Morales plugin as well to uh, supply your data. I'm interested to know how Covalent is working under the hood. Does Covalent bring in data from many chains into a backend data warehouse, which can be indexed and queried a lot faster than directly querying the chain? Great question. We basically uh, host full archival nodes of every single blockchain. And each of these, um, each of these archival nodes are channeled into a database, like a traditional backend data warehouse. And then they are sliced and diced and into each of these endpoints that you see. Yeah. How does Covalent generate revenue? Are the APIs completely free or are there some terms? So great question as well. For now, um, our blockchain partners, right? Um, they pay us to index their data. So that is how we generate revenue for now. Although, you know, uh, times are getting a bit hard and <laughs> Um, I guess like, I suppose there are talks in the pipeline about coming up with a pricing tier that provides better kind of, uh, uh, more, what you call like higher API call volumes 
for the pay for the price pricier tier, right? Because a lot of our clients are asking for that. Oh, can we can we exceed the five core per API? That's currently not possible because if one person hogs up all the bandwidth, then um, a lot it really decreases the performance of our other customers. Whereas if we have a higher pricing tier, then I suppose we can have differentiated service. But the uh, five API calls per second free tier will always be available um, as far as I know. Yeah. Are there any data points covalent and especially keen for us to use? Yes. So actually, right, um, the slightly more difficult, I hope I'm still sharing my screen. The slightly more difficult endpoints to implement and for you to explore, but it's very, very powerful is the get log events by contract address and get log events by topic hash endpoints. So uh, we want to see, I suppose, like more people trying those endpoints. Um, but that said, I believe the best submissions are always the best ideas, right? Best um, use case. Are you solving a real concrete problem, right? Um, is the solution that you come up for this the right solution? So I'm personally of a proponent, like you need to start with a genuine problem and not the other way around. Yep. Yep, the rate limit is five requests per second. The, the lag for the data refresh is two blocks. That's right. Um, so two blocks, meaning that, you know, it varies depending on how long one block takes to produce on each. Is covalent similar to the graph? We are both uh, data services, but our approach is pretty different. Uh, the graph is based on, um, you know, GraphQL. And for each of the queries, I believe you need to write like subgraphs. Um, whereas we take a more like unified approach, which just means that um, we have one standardized URL format, right? And you just need to change one chain ID and it will give you the standardized response that you're going to get. Uh, personally, I have not tried GraphQL too much, so I can't speak for um, what's the experience the differences in experience like, but you know, with these things, you can only know if you try it for yourself. Uh, on a history API, can we query back to the beginning of the chain? Uh, I believe so. I believe so. You can set, for this one, it returns you max the last 30 days, I believe. But for this one, as of any block height, you can query all the way back to the beginning of the chain, get block height to the beginning of the chain as well. So yes, there are some which has limitations, which I believe is the last 30 days for this. Looks like we got maybe one more question actually. Yeah, uh, what's the SLA around response times? Unfortunately, uh, because we are still providing a free service, we do not have the contractual uh, SLA, but um, from, from the responses that I've tried so far, and for a lot of the responses, response times that I've tried when building apps, it is pretty fast. And um, sometimes for specific really data heavy and hugely data expensive kind of like endpoints, it might be slower, but I guess my engineering team is constantly on it to really improve the response times as well. Kind of stuff. What other kind of stuff do you think would be cool to be built using Covalent apart from dashboards and similar? Great question again. Um, you see, so the, the API, this kind of API service, is great, is part of a Web2 stack, if you know what I mean. The Web3 stack being um, Solidity, et cetera, right? Uh, so 
within like our API is a read-only API. We do not allow you to kind of write onto the smart, smart contract. And you do not even need to write smart contract for our hackathon, right? We are about really bringing visibility into what happens on chain and that's our niche. So that's why a lot of the, a lot of the um, bounties that we put up are about like dashboards, analytics, visualizations, um, and also wallets, anything that has got to do with, you know, visibility into what goes on chain. So that's really our niche. Of course, we have, we've had a lot of apps as well that has extended it, right? Into not building these front end client side applications that Covalent is great for, but also supplementing it with a, a smart contract based full DAP, right? So let's say you've got, you've created a DAP and it emits like a transfer event with every single function call. And then the person uses like uh, our API to get the, get the transfer event to display on the front end to kind of immediately kind of make it like a full feature application. Not only is the interactions on the blockchain, but you can visualize the user can use it through a UI on the front end. So that's, that's an example of a full feature DAP, right? If you can build the DAP, that's great. But we don't necessarily need you to uh, fully code in Solidity to qualify for a bounty because uh, our API is most of the time used on the client side. Yep. That's right. And I believe Steve has shared about the, um, the, our hackathon prize as well that you can click through and find out. Yeah, just wanted to kind of post that and say a little more about it. You guys are having a $4,000 prize pool with us in this hackathon. That's so right. a lot of money to kind of go around there um, if you incorporate any type of covalent API. So definitely look into yep. that link that I posted, learn a little more there. But if that's our questions, want to give a big thank you to Covalent and Lei Bing for being here today. Had an awesome demo showing kind of Covalence API and um, showcasing the few projects that have won hackathons. Actually, I think we're very useful to kind of our hackers and showing what can you build? What really can I create out of this? Mm. So I think that was very useful as well. So thanks everybody for joining us here today. Um, this will be recorded and posted on our YouTube as well. If you want to go back and see kind of the answers that Li Bing was um, describing to all those great questions, um, come back. But um, overall, have a great day. And thanks again to Covalent and Labing. Hope you have a good one. Thanks, Steve. Thanks to Encode team for having us. Thanks, everyone, for attending. Take care.